All right, uh, DJ Bushu, thank you as always. How are you? How are you? Good, good, yeah. What yeah. about you? Uh, I was at Greasy Jane's last night and I. Greasy Jane? Yeah, I banged my knee. It's all right. All right, well, okay, next time you see her, tell that fool she owes me money. <laughs> Who doesn't owe you money? That's the problem. You okay, look, I thought Greasy was literal, you know? like. Yeah. Not figurative, but I guess it was both. So you, look, that's on me. That's on me. Stop giving people money. It's weird, okay? Okay, I mean, I, I, I didn't know the IRS didn't need gift cards. I mean, maybe they did. I... You're too trusting. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> that's on you. All right, guys. Let's get started. Uh, so quick administrative things. Homework 2 and Project 1 went out uh, earlier this week. Homework 2 will be due on Sunday, September 25th. Project 1 will be due on October 2nd. Again, as all projects in the semester, I please encourage you to get started as sooner rather than later. So we will have a QA session. Uh, it should be Thursday, not Tuesday. Next, not this Thursday, but next Thursday on the 22nd at 8 p.m. Again, that'll be a resume. And that'll be like a quick introduction about what the project's about, uh, what you're required to do, and then you can ask questions for this. The other thing we do also uh, in this class is that the, all the projects are due on Sundays. Uh, and we specifically don't have office hours on Sundays because we don't want you to be, you know, use that as a crutch and like, oh, I'll just come to office hours the day, the day it's due and try to figure things out. So we have special office hours on the Sunday, or sorry, the Saturday before the four programming assignments are due. Uh, and this will be multiple TAs. Uh, so, that, you know, that, that way the queue is not super long. So the, so the special office hours on Saturday will be held on October 1st at 3 p.m. And we'll post on Piazza where this will be. And this will be on campus. Okay? All right, any questions? Yes? Uh, because we know that everyone's going to try to wait till the very end. We're telling you not to. All right? And so. Uh, so that, that's like the emergency, emergency office. Correct, yes. And then we have multiple TAs because we know everyone's going to show up on that, on that one. And that's why there's no. There's, well, all right, look, what, do, what else are you going to do, right? Uh, <laughs> This is actually a holdover from the pandemic. We did this during the pandemic, and it seemed to help. Uh, okay, but we, we're not going to have office hours on Sundays for thing, when things are due. Okay, so that at least forces you to figure something out before you before the day is due. All right. So, all right. So last class, or the last couple of classes, we spent a lot of, a lot of time talking about what does the database look like on disk. Uh, and so now we're going to talk about what happens when you bring this uh, these pages that are that are in the database back into memory and how we're going to facilitate uh, that process. And remember that the, the, the database system, uh, most, most database systems can't operate directly on data when they're on disk. There is some hardware that can do that, but, but as far as I know, no, no system actually can do that right now. Um, basically, Samsung will sell you an SSD that has ARM cores on it, and you can run queries down on the ARM cores right, directly on disk. We're, ignore all of that. Right? This, is, this is sort of the classic canonical way you would implement this. Again, because we're a von Neumann architecture, we can't, since we can't do anything uh, when the database, when data is on disk, we got to bring it to memory. So we're going to talk about how to facilitate that movement back and forth. And this is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to achieve here is to build a software system or database system that can manage uh, a database that exceeds the amount of memory that's available to it. So the two sort of things two, that we need to consider in how we decide what the, how we're going to do this movement back and forth is the spatial control and the temporal control. So the spatial control has to do with the actual like, physical layout of the data on, on the storage device. And this goes back to that, uh, the idea we talked about before, where you want to maximize the amount of sequential access. So you want to sort of organize things as, we, as, as they get written out so that they reside on disk as close together as possible. So that if I need to go fetch a, you know, a range of data, that data is going to be contiguous blocks on the storage device rather than a bunch of different random locations. Right? And likewise, in going in the other direction, if I need to write it out, sequential writes are always going to be faster than random writes. The other thing we got to consider is also the temporal control. So this is the, at what time during, the, you know, the, the, where we're trying to do something in the system, when should the database read data from disk and when should it write data for, out the disk, right? And the tricky thing is going to be, and, and I said this before about why we don't want the OS to do this for us, that we need, the database needs to be aware of who made a change to a page, like who, what, like what query made a page dirty and modified something. 
And at what point is it safe for us to go write that data out the disk? This will come up later uh, when we talk about transactions, but it's just this is reiterating the idea that we don't want the OS to do this. We know what's going on. We have to take full control, and we being the database system, because we'll, we'll get paid lots of money to build this. All right, so this is the overall architecture that we talked about. Uh, and again, so the last three classes were down here, the pages on disk. And now we're talking about up in here, inside our database system, inside the process, we have something we're calling the buffer pool, some, some, some blocks of memory that we, we can use. Uh, and then other parts of the system that we haven't talked about yet, like the X engine, uh, they're going to run queries that need to access data. Somehow they're going to say, hey, I know I need, I need page two. It goes to the buffer pool, asks for page two. Uh, the buffer pool has to say, OK, well, I need to get the page directory, because that'll tell me where the you know, page two is located on disk. And once I have that in memory, then I can, find, I can jump to whatever the location it is, make the, the right syscall to the operating system to get that page, and we copy it into memory in our buffer pool. So then what we hand back to the execution engine, again, thinking of the layers that we talked about before, is a pointer to page two, right? And how exactly we got it in to memory, uh, the execution engine doesn't need to know, doesn't need to care. Not entirely true, but for the most part, right? So the key thing you need to understand about uh, what we're going to do here, and it's going to be different than maybe when you think about uh, the me memory map files from the OS, is that if we go evict page two, because we don't need it for, you know, in the, for, you know, we don't need it right now, we, 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 we discard it. But the execution engine comes back and says, hey, I need page, page two again. The buffer pool is, is allowed to put it into a different location in memory. Right? So, so again, this is different than, than the, the MAP stuff, where you'll get the same virtual address for some page in a file over and over again. In our world, the, the, the virtual address could be different. Because the database system can decide, OK, well, this is what I have in memory right now. This is, this is the, you know, here's the page that I could, could get free if I evict it, because it's not, not high priority. So therefore, let me go put page two there. It doesn't have to require you to put it back in the same location over and over again. So today's class, we're going to talk about at high level what a buffer pool manager is. And also, also say, too, that I'm going to call the buffer pool manager. I think the textbook calls it buffer manager. Sometimes it's called buffer cache or page cache. But these are all essentially the same thing. It just means that it's, it's, the memory, it's the memory sort of manager of the database system that's specifically for moving pages in and out from disk. Then we'll talk about replacement policies, and then we'll talk about other types of memory pools you can maintain in, in your database system. OK? And we'll finish up today's lecture also with a uh, quick intro to what Project 1 will be about. OK, so we've kind of covered this uh, at a high level already, so let's go down to more detail. So the buffer pool is going to be some memory region in our database system uh, that's going to be just an array of fixed size pages. Right? Maybe we talked about the, the, the harbor page size is 4 kilobytes. The database system can have 4, 8, 16 kilobyte pages. can have any size page that, that it particularly wants. And then the, in this array, we're going to have you know, the, the, at different offsets, because the fixed length, that'll be a location where we can store a page that we can bring in from disk. And so when it's in memory in our buffer pool, a free slot or free location, I, I use the word slot, I don't want to say that, a free entry in, in our array, we're going to call this a frame. Right? And it's called a frame because we can't use slot because if that's in slotted pages, you can't use block or can't use page. Right? We're going to call it a frame. This is, again, it's, what? Yes? So how does the, if it's fixed size pages, how does it His question is, if it's fixed size pages, how do we account for variable length size pages? Yeah, You'd have to have a separate buffer pool for each of those different sizes. Oh. We'll see examples of this, right? In my MySQL example, yeah, so that MySQL example, it would be, it'd have to have, you no. Know, here's where I put two kilobyte pages, four kilobyte pages, and so forth. You allocate space for that. All right, so when a database system, when the database system requests a page, uh, we're going to go out to disk, get it. Just using you know, a file system operation, whatever you want to use. Uh, and then we're going to copy it into our, our buffer pool in, in a free frame. And then if we need another page, we do the same thing. We just copy it in. So now, though, we need to be able to, to do a, have expose the ability or have the capability to let another part of the system ask for a page by its identifier and then go give them back that pointer. So the indirection layer we're going to use for that is called the page table. Right? Actually, we'll go ahead. So 
we'll get to this later, but like if, if it's something modifies a page that's in the buffer pool, uh, we're not going to immediately write it back, as I said, because we have to wait to make sure that this is safe. So if in like OS parlance or caching parlance, this would be called a write back cache. So I'll write to a page, dirty it, but then it's not immediately written back to the backing store. Right? I'll, I'll do that at some later point. So in my example four, I showed where the execution engine says, hey, give me page two. Right? And I didn't say how exactly you figured out that that, that, that that frame had page two. And this is going to be handled by called, what is called the page table. So this is going to keep track of all the pages that are currently in memory. And it can, can route uh, a page ID request to a particular frame. And again, there's no guarantee that the ordering of the pages in, in, our, in our buffer pool, in our frames, is going to match how it exists on disk and file. So there needs to be some additional metadata we have to maintain in our page table uh, to keep track of what's going on with our pages. So the first thing we can have is a dirty flag that basically says this, this, uh, this page has been modified by another query, and therefore don't write about the disk just yet uh, unless we know it's safe. And again, you can store this either in the page itself or you can store this in the page table. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Different systems do different things. Um, and then the next thing you're going to have is what is called a pin or a reference counter. And the idea here is that if, I, if my query needs to touch, do something on this page, uh, I can set the pin flag to it, and that prevents the buffer pool manager from evicting it. All right, so say like I, I, I'm running a query, and I need to read this page. I go bring it to my buffer pool. I can then pin it, do whatever reads I need to do, then I'm done with it, and then I unpin it. And this prevents the buffer pool manager from swapping it out with another page until I'm finished. Right? It's a simple coarse grained mutex. You can have a pin counter that says how many, you know, how many, uh, how many queries have this thing pinned and increment and decrement it as needed. But a, a simple, simple Boolean flag would be is, is enough. All right. So then, if I come along here, say now I, I have a query that wants to read, you know, get something out of this page. Uh, I want to acquire a latch on the page table. Uh, and this is going to prevent another thread or another process or another worker in my system from stealing this, this, this frame or this location in the page table and putting something else in it before I can finish it. So we have, uh, we're assuming that we're running in a multi-threaded system. We have to make sure that we don't have threads, you know, overwrite each other or get, you know, cause problems with race conditions. So we use sort of these, these, these low-level uh, synchronization, synchronization methods like pinning and these latches to prevent other threads from doing things and clobbering us. Yes? So does the latch only prevent others from writing, or does it also prevent others from reading? This is, so this is going to help. So it's a latch, not a lock. I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, but it, think of it like a lock. So it's a mutex here that's going to prevent other threads from modifying the entry in this page table. right? So then we go copy what we need, update the page table, not point to it, and then we re release the latch. Right? The pin prevents you from swapping out the page and evicting it. So to sort of solve different problems. Yes? So if the buffer pool is the right back cache, then I suppose the buffer pool is called out in which memory? So, uh, so his question is, if the, uh, if the buff buffer pool is a right back cache, it's in memory, so it's volatile. So upon crash, do we lose the contents of what's in memory? Yes. And there's correctness reasons why you want to do that. Yes? Uh, why here, uh, page two is like uh, saved like two positions after page three, not like right after? So his, question is why, so his question is, why is page two put here instead of r right in between page one and page three? No, like on the page table, I mean. Oh, page table here? Yeah. Uh, for say, say it's a hash table, it's, and then in front of your location is random. Yeah, because again, I can have a billion pages. I don't need to go in, in, in order because they're coming in at different times as well. Like this thing could be page one, page two, three, and then page a billion, and then this is the only free free frame, so I take that one. Yes. His statement is, is that the page table is essentially a hash map, a hash table, that stores the metadata about what's in, in memory, more or less, yes, at high level. But like the metadata, some of the metadata you could store in the page itself, or you could store it in the hash table. All right, so I want to bring up the thing that he, he asked, when I sort of corrected him, 
uh, and I'm wearing a mask so you can't see me smile, but because this happens every year, um, the difference between a lock and a latch. So if you're coming from like an OS background, uh, what I'm gonna refer to as a latch in the OS world is referred to as a lock. But in the database world, a lock is a higher level construct or protection mechanism to synchronize threads or, or queries running at the same time from on the higher level concepts or objects in the database. So I can take a lock on a tuple, I can take a lock on a table, a lock on, lock on a database. You can take lock on pages and other physical constructs. But the idea here is that I would take a lock during a transaction on say a tuple, and I would hold that lock throughout the entire transaction, right? A latch in my world is what you can consider a mutex. It's that's a low level prim a synchronization primitive that protects some critical section of a data structure. Uh, and it's something you take, the, the thread could take it for, uh, you know, acquire it, do some small update or some change, and then immediately re release it. Right? This will make more sense when we talk about uh, uh, tr you know, transactions after the midterm, but just understand that like, there's low level, you, know, you, you had to do this for, for P0 anyway. There's a low level you know, synchronization method like a mutex, that's what I refer to as a latch. And there won't be any deadlock detection protection for us in our, in, when, when we use latches. It's up for us as programmers to make sure that we don't have, we don't write crappy code. Whereas if you take locks in, on, on queries or take lock during queries and transactions, that's dealing with application code, which is usually going to be stupid, and therefore we have to have the protection mechanisms built in the system to prevent deadlocks. So again, all you really need to know at this point is a latch is a mutex. This is also further confusing because we, we're writing our projects in C++. But you look in the C++ manual, they have a notion of a latch as well, which is essentially a, a, a countdown barrier, right? So it's not, when I say latch, it's not the C++ one. It's, it's the database one here, okay? All right, the other thing I want to bring up also the distinction between the page table and the page directory. So again, the page directory is going to be our mapping from a page ID to some location in the database files that reside on disk, right? And this has to be persistent because anytime we crash and come back, we need to know where pages are in, in, our, in our files. And so we have to be very careful making sure this thing is always written out safely. The page table is an informal data structure that we maintain in memory just to map the page IDs to frames in, in our buffer pool. So in this world, we don't care if we crash and lose the contents of the page table because we'll, we'll, re, we'll repopulate that when we come back. Some systems like to be clever and they recognize that instead of ha having a cold start on your, on your page table cache, uh, you can actually per periodically write out the contents of the page table to disk so that upon crash, you come back, you load it in that page table, and then you prefetch a bunch of the, the pages you expect to, to read when, when you start running queries again. All right, I know MySQL can do this. I don't, Postgres has other, other things we can talk about too, right? But you know, for our purposes for this class here, it's, it's all in memory. If we crash, it, it, we, we lose it, but that's okay. Because the, the, the data that we care about is actually in the disk pages. On... Yes? This question is, if a transaction, when a transaction ends or commits or uh, finishes, uh, will we write out the dirty pages? Let's pause that conversation. The answer is no, but we'll get, we'll, like, after the semester. Or sorry, after, after the, the midterm, the midterm. <laughs> sorry. You flush the, uh, the previous, you flush the log pages before you flush the, 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 the dirty, dirty pages. But to his point, like, that, that's the example where I was saying where, if I have a query that updates a page, uh, you know, a, a, a table page, I don't want to write out that dirty page to disk until I have a, a log record that says, hey, I made this change. Then at that point, uh, it's safe for us to write out that, the, the, the table page. The when you actually write it out can depend, we'll get to this in a second, but like you could write it out, the, the, you know, if you know the log record's been saved, you could either have the eviction policy write out the dirty page, or you could have like a background writer at the dirty page. There's a whole bunch of different mechanisms to like when you actually want to do it as well. But you always have to do it uh, after the log page has been flushed to disk. But that's like, again, after the uh, midterm. All right, so this is what I've described so far it's in the first 10 minutes of class or so. That, that's the basic buffer pool manager, right? Pretty straightforward. Match page IDs to frames, and you get back pointers and do whatever you want with it, right? Of the challenge is how to make this actually high performance. How do we make this actually uh, work really well and do things or have optimizations 
that the operating system is not going to do or can't do, right? Because we're inside the database system. We, we, see, we know all the queries that are running. They're declarative. We know what they actually want to do. So we can start making decisions now about how we evict things, where we, when, when we prefetch, when we write things out, that will get us, you know, achieve us better, uh, you know, hit ratios for, for our cache. So the, the first two sort of type of allocation policies you can have, um, you can have sort of a global policy where you just, here's some, uh, here's the procedures I'm going to use for all possible pages that are in my buffer pool. I don't care whether they're from an index or a table or what table they're from. Uh, you just sort of have this set for all, all things. Um, but then we can actually have more fine-grained or local policies where we can, we can determine what the query is trying to do, like what table it's trying to touch, uh, what the access pattern actually is. And then we can decide how to evict things uh, or move things in and out based on what that query is actually trying to do. Right? And then the, the, the most typical way to do this is in a, in a, in a, in a production system is you want a sort of combination of both of these. So you want to set the sort of policy at the global level that you think is for overall the right thing for your application, but then potentially for individual database objects, like individual indexes, tables, or individual queries, uh, you can have things that are, um, you can have things that, that are more localized, right? So you can basically allocate some memory just for a particular query uh, and do certain things you know, for that, that memory you've allocated and then maybe not worry about uh, the other queries running at the same time. And then we'll see this as we go through this lecture as well. The, this is a good example where the, the differentiation between the enterprise, very expensive database systems, and the, the very good but not, you know, not, as, not as robust systems like, uh, or complex systems like Postgres and MySQL. Like, we'll see DB2 in, exa in, a, in, a, in, a, in a second, but like DB2, you can allocate buffer pools on, a, on tables, on indexes, like you can be very fine grain of, and have different policies for each of those buffer pools. Whereas in like MySQL, you get one buffer pool and it's it's good enough. It's, it's all you get for the for all the queries and all the tables. So the optimization we're going to talk about is having multiple buffer pools, prefetching, scan sharing, and then the last one will be buffer pool bypass. And then we'll talk about again the eviction policies, how to decide when when to, when to write things out. Okay. So the first most obvious optimization you can have, as I, as I already said, is that you can have instead of having one buffer pool with one page table and one set of frames. For the entire system, we can have multiple buffer pool instances, and you can have you, then you can assign these buffer pool instances on a, on a per database, per table, uh, you know, per index, and so forth. Um, it's essentially partitioning the memory that you're going to allocate to the database system to different logical components or logical entities in your database uh, to to improve locality and to improve uh, cache efficiency. The other side effect you get from this as well is that you're also going to prove latch contention because that page table, if everyone's going to the same page table and I, I got to like take latches to go, go do lookups and read and modify it, if all your threads are doing that, all your workers are doing that, because for all your tables, it's one giant page table, then that, that'll become a bottleneck. Um, so again, so these are all commercial systems that, that uh, support this. DB2 and Oracle are still, uh, they all make a lot of money, but like DB2 and Oracle are still uh, widely used. Sybase and Informix, they were hot in the 80s, uh, not so much anymore. Although, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of enterprises run them. SQL Server is, is, is actually super up-to-date, super modern. That's really good. The MySQL one is the most obvious one to do, or the most easiest one to do. We'll see it in, in two more slides. But basically, you tell it how many buffer pool instances they want, you want, and they just hash on the, on the, on the page ID you're doing a lookup on, and then just, you know, to, to just jump to a different one. Yes? His, all right, so his question is, what, what do I think is the best data system in the world right now? Yeah. That is not something we, sh we should talk about in the middle of the semester. Uh, we, let's talk about this at the end. Okay. I've already sort of said what I think, what I, think I would use, what, what I do use for stuff. Postgres? Yeah, Postgres. Yeah, why? why? Okay, so we'll get to this later. <laughs> um, I think for this class, actually, and we're going to use it in a demo, it's a great textbook definition of a, of a database system, right? Uh, does it have some things that that think I should be improved? Think could be improved? Yes. Um, is the query optimizer the best? No. SQL Server has the best query optimizer. It's phenomenal. Uh, but like for ninety nine percent of people, it's probably good enough for some things, right? All right. So 
I just want to show you some quick sync. Oh, sorry, it's quick syntax how to do this in DB2. Uh, not that everyone's ever here going to run it, uh, but let's just show you. Guys, you, you, they have SQL commands where I can create a buffer pool. I can set the size of the buffer pool, how many pages. I can set the size of the pages, and then now I can create a table space. Think of this as like the, I think uh, in Postgres they call this the, in the catalog calls this schema. It's think of it like a namespace. So I can assign this table space to be backed by or managed by this buffer pool, and now I create tables in, in that table space. So now I would have a, a custom buffer pool just for this, this one table here, right? So the way you actually handle this in, in, in the system itself, you have two approaches. The first is you have this notion of an object ID, and that can map the object to, you use that as a mapping to get you to what buffer pool has the data that you want, right? So this is not SQL, but to say it's like get record one, two, three. Uh, and if I can convert that record into uh, some kind of identifier with the object ID, page ID, and slot number, we saw in SQL Server, uh, I think third class, right? We showed how if you convert the, the record ID into a row ID uh, into its, to its subunits, you would see this information. And then we just have some kind of mapping that says, okay, for object ID X, you would use this buffer pool versus another one, right? So this is happening before you hit up the page table. Right? So you don't have to take uh, a latch to figure this out. Uh, the other approach is the MySQL one, as I said, where you just take whatever the, the, the record ID you want, hash it, mod by the number of buffer pools you've allocated, and then that does route you to the location that has what you want. All right, so the basic thing is we need to guarantee, though, that the one page, uh, physical page, only exists in one buffer pool, right? Because it wouldn't be good if, like, one thread does this mapping, lands this buffer pool for page one, two, three, and then another thread gets a different mapping to a different buffer pool, and I have two copies in uh, in memory, and that's a, that's that's bad. We don't want to do that. Yes. Uh, I still don't understand why having multiple buffer pools is beneficial in this case because if you, I had a single one, it would be just larger. So this question is, what's the advantage of having these multiple buffer pools? Um, the advantage is that you can have different policies on how you decide to evict things, right? I can have different page sizes now. On a, you, know, on, you know, I can have a larger page for this table because I'm reading big things in. Uh, and then I can reduce the amount of concurrency or contention I have on my page table because I have to take latches when I go inside that. So again, DB2 is great. Like, in, well, DB2's uh, ability to, to manage buffer pools is fantastic because I can create these and drop these without having to restart the system. In MySQL, I, I don't know about Oracle, but uh, it doesn't have multiple buffer pools. MySQL does. In MySQL, you can't create multiple more buffer, buffer pool instances without restarting the whole system. And that's going to be bad because then you got to throw away memory and you got to read it all back in from disk. Yes? Uh, isn't like having multiple buffer pools basically the best for like fragmentation in your um, essentially in your memory where you have a lot of unutilized space for different operations? So his statement is isn't, if, you have, if you have multiple buffer pools, couldn't that increase the risk of having fra uh, memory fragmentation where you have unused space in memory? I mean, yeah, like if you do something stupid, yes. Like if you. No, I mean, like if you have a page that has zero tables in it, or sorry, if, it, if you have a table that has zero data in it, zero records, and then I say, okay, let me assign you a buffer pool that has two gigs of memory, but I never use it, yeah, like the data system will do what you ask for, but is it the right thing to do? No. All right? Yes. So, so his question is, why is having multiple buffer pools reduced latch contention? So it's here in the page table, right? Like, uh, depending you, you do your, your latching protection in your page table, which we'll cover Tuesday next week, to so the entire data structure, which is stupid, because then I have to protect the whole thing, right? Or I have to take on individual pages. Uh, and again, that, that could prevent, whether it's a rewrite of the latch or, or not, like, Everyone's coming into sort of one uh, one data structure and trying to figure things out, and you have to have the latches to protect things. So that that's definitely it's always going to be contention. But now it's like divide and conquer. Now if I have multiple page page tables, you can go here, I can go here. We don't care about each other. We can acquire the latches very quickly and to do what we need to do. Right, but if you if you need page one two three and I need page four five six, four five six is in this buffer pool. I can go there and do whatever I need. You have to go over there.
His question is, the buffer pool has latches to themselves that are specific to the, the buffer pool. Yeah, like they, they each have their own page table. Yes. All right, cool. Uh -huh. so, so, sorry, just to clarify. So when you latch on, when you latch on a page table, you latch on the whole page table. It, it's, it's quite, same as if you latch on the page table, do you latch on the whole page table? It depends on the implementation. The easiest one would be latch the whole thing. You can have more fine-grained latches. I think we'll cover this. Uh, I think we might cover this. I know we talked about index concurrent control. I don't. I think we talked about latching in in hash tables for that course or that lecture. I, I'll have to see whether we cover it ne next Tuesday. But like again, it's the easiest thing to take a latch the whole thing, and that's going to be a bottleneck. But nobody nobody should do that. All right. So the other thing we can do now is prefetch uh, based on what the query wants to do. All right. So again, remember the 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 heap files are unordered. So uh, there's no guarantee that the um, the order in which you're going to read pages matches what's going to be in the order on on the uh, on disk. But let's assume for simplicity for this first version, it is, right? So if I have a query comes along, Q Q1, and say this is just doing a complete sequential scan on the on the table or right, on these disk pages here, right? Well, say there's nothing in our memory buffer pool when we start. So when I go look up page zero uh, and I ask the page table, do you have this? It's going to say no. So now I, I got to go fetch it from disk, right? And then same thing. I go get page one. It's not memory. I got to go fetch it in. But now the data system can try to be clever and say, OK, well, I know what you need to read. Uh, you're going to read this entire, entire block of data or the entire segment of pages. So when I go read page one, maybe I'll also go read, read ahead and, and, and bring in page two and three. And then now it knows that. Well, I've already read page zero. I'm not going to go back and read that again. So I can use reuse this space to 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 bring in prefetch the page, uh, so that when the query starts running again, uh, there's not a there's not a disk stall or not a stall waiting for the pages that I needed because they're already in memory. Right? I can do this for all the other ones. So you can do this in the OS. You can pass in flags uh, to do uh, prefetching. Um, but the challenge is going to be when you want to start prefetching things that aren't, aren't always going to be sequential scans. Right? So let's say we have a, a range query like this, uh, select star from A, where value between 1 and two, 100 and 250. And say for this one, we're going to do an index scan. Now, I haven't explained what a B plus tree is yet. We'll get to this next week as well. But just think it's an it's order preserving or, or order tree data structure. And all the values are going to be on, on the leaf, leaf nodes, right? Like this. So now as I start, uh, start executing this query, right? It has to look at the index page zero because that's at the root. I go get that, bring that into memory. Then I jump down and go read index page one. That's not in memory. I go fetch that. But now the system could recognize that, okay, I need to, I'm at the leaf nodes and I'm going to read this page and this page. But those pages aren't contiguous on disk, right? They're at different locations. So the OS is not going to be able to handle this because it doesn't know what's in these pages, it doesn't know what a B plus tree is. It just sees a bunch of reads and writes on single pages. But because we're the ones managing what are in these pages, we know it's a, it's a tree. We know that what's, what the leaf knows. We know it's going to be ahead of us. So we go ahead and, and prefetch these guys as needed. Right? All right, so this is a really simple example. I mean, you can imagine more, more complex things you, you can do with this as well. And again, the commercial systems will be much better at this than, than the open source ones. All right, the next trick we can do is called scan sharing. And the idea here is that we can reuse any data that we retrieved for one query. Uh, we can reuse it for other queries that are maybe trying to read the same thing at the, at the same time. Right? These are sometimes called synchronized scans. If, if you look up in, I think Postgres calls them that. Um, so this is different than result caching, uh, like where I take the output of a query and I can reuse it for other queries that have the, maybe looking for the same thing. This is really at the low level at the storage, storage manager uh, uh, portion of the system in, in the buffer pool where we're reusing pages that one query has fetched and reuse them for another, another query. Right? The way this is basically going to work is uh, obviously without, without this sort of scan sharing technique, if my query shows up and I read the same page as, that you just read, then I get that for free because they'll be in, in the buffer pool together. But the idea here is that if I'm scanning a lot of data, I want to piggyback off of your cursor so that I read pages in the same order that you do, rather than maybe me starting from the beginning and having to go fetch things all back over again. 
right? So I'll show an example of what, what I mean by this. There's other optimizations you can do where if you and I are doing some kind of computation that are exactly the same on the data, we can, we can reuse those. But that's at the upper level of the execution engine, and we can ignore that for now. So, uh, sorry, like this. All right, so uh, here's the, the most simple approach is, as I said, where the query shows up, and another query is already running, and the system can recognize that that other query is, is, gonna, is reading the same things I'm going to need to read. I can pick, again, jump on their, on their cursor and read things along, along with them. So this is fully supported in IBM DB2, uh, uh, SQL Server, and Postgres. Oracle, as far as I checked, uh, I, 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 I checked last year. I haven't checked this year. Um, they only support this sharing technique if you have the exact same query, like literally the same query with the same SQL syntax. It can piggyback off of it. Whereas uh, Postgres and SQL Server and, and, my, and, and DB2, they can be a bit clever saying, OK, you're, just reading, you're reading the same table as I am. Let, let me jump along with you. So in previous years, I, I forgot to mention, I said Postgres didn't support this. And then on Stack Overflow, someone, someone watched the video and complained. Uh, and, they were, and he also says I have bad hygiene, too. Like, well, that's, that's old news. All right, so, um, so uh, but there is a flag called synchronized scans in, in Postgres. They've, they've added this. Uh, this is hard to demo because it's like a race condition. It's really hard to get it to like, work exactly at the same time. And it's hard to determine, like, did they actually use it without si sitting through GDB in the system. Yes. No, 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 no. No, I made a mistake in previous lectures where I said Postgres didn't support this, and then this person called me out and said I was wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. So his question is: After your piggybacking, or your your cursor sharing is done. You got to go back and maybe read the data you missed. Yeah. yeah. We'll go through this example. All right. So. We have query one here. Let's do a complete sequential scan on table A and compute, compute the sum. So it starts at the beginning. Nothing's in our buffer pool. So it's just going to do what, like, what it normally would, scan down, fetch pages, at, and bring them to buffer pool as, as needed. All right? And then now at this point, we need page three. We don't have any space in our buffer pool because we only have three, three frames. So it's going to go ahead and pick, pick page zero. Right? Throw that out and then bring in page three and do what it wants to do. But now, say at this point, another query shows up and wants to do the exact same thing, right? Compute an aggregation on table A. Like, we, we can ignore result caching, that, that computer, just, again, just think low level, we're accessing. So if we had this query do exactly what the first guy did, where it started at the very beginning and then scanned down, well, I just evicted page zero and it needs page zero, that would be bad. So now I'm basically, I just threw it out and I gotta fetch it, fetch it right back in. Right, so I'm not going to be thrashing uh, the contents of, of my cache. So instead, the data system can say, oh, OK, you're just doing uh, you know, a, a scan on A or a scan on this table. Q1's already doing that. Let me, let, me, let me hop you on this one, too. Go along for the ride. Read the same thing that Q1 is reading. Now, at this point, Q1 goes away because they turn the result back to uh, the client or to the application. But as he, as he pointed out, the data system would recognize, oh, well, I skipped a bunch of pages uh, at the beginning of, of, of the table that you didn't read because I did this, this, this scan sharing thing. Let me go back and put you back at the top and scan down the, the parts that you're missing. Right? So another interesting thing about this as well is say, say if the query was slightly different, like with a limit 100 clause, uh, then in this case here, Q2 could actually just stop at the end of, of Q1. Right? Um, and without having to read everything. But now, the result actually might be different if I run this again and start at the top versus the bottom. But on the relational model, that's OK, right? Because tables are unordered. So it may be the case with the scan sharing technique, you may actually get different results if you have something like a limit clause without you know, a where clause or an order by. But from a relational model perspective, that's OK. It makes our lives a lot easier. OK. All right, so the next technique or optimization we can do is called buffer pool bypass. Um, and the idea here is that uh, if we, if our, our query is running along and it's accessing data, um, it may be the case that the data we're, we're bringing in, we don't want to put into the buffer pool because we have to take latches on it, we've got to get a frame, copy it in there, and so forth, right? 
And so instead, the database system can decide to uh, sort of maintain a little private buffer pool for, the, for a query that it copies data into it and then immediately evict it uh, when it needs more memory. So the downside of this is that these, these private buffer pools may not be shared across different queries unless you do more bookkeeping. So maybe the case that my query reads a page and then you read the page, uh, and long as, it, long as it's read only, that's OK. Uh, but maybe it's two, two fetches to disk instead of just one. Right? So all of the, uh, again, high-end systems, including Postgres, actually support this. In Formix, they call these light scans. Uh, it's basically like you can use this for like data that you know you're not going to need uh, for long periods of time. Like maybe some intimate result you computed, and then you, you immediately just throw it away. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, this is sort of specific to Postgres. Um, and this is in addition to uh, the memory map files and virtual memory stuff we talked about before, the operating system is also going to maintain what is called a page cache uh, below the file system that's going to allow it to buffer and, and store, store pages that it reads from disk. Right? And you get this by default in, in, in a modern, modern operating system. So the way it sort of works is that you have your database systems running in user space, uh, and then you have down below you have you have the operating system. So when I do a read now, I do a read on the operating system, or sorry, on the file system. That's a syscall, and then now the file system can say, oh, the OS is maintaining a page cache. Let me see whether the page you're looking for is in my page cache in, in the kernel. If if no, then I'll go down a disk and get it. Right. So the operating system by default is going to try to use all the free memory that it possibly has. Uh, to, to as, as a zone page cache, right? Because one, it doesn't know what's up above. It doesn't know that there's a database system memory managing its own, its own memory, right? It just it just tries to make things run fast. So if it has free memory, it's going to use it for a, or a page cache. So most database systems will not do not want to use the OS page cache, and they will turn it off uh, by default in you know in, in most situations. Um, the only system that I know that that always uses the OS page cache is Postgres. Right, so if you don't even use the page, it would pay cash, OS page cache, you use what's called odirect or direct IO, where when now you do your reads on the file system, you say bypass the page cache, don't maintain a copy it in there for me, just go give me the go give me the, the, the data directly. Right? This is gonna also matter for writes as well, because if you want to do a write, you in, in our world we'll make sure we don't lose any data. So we want to make sure our data lands a disk uh, immediately when we say it is. So that one, even if you do direct I.O., you still have to do an F-sync uh, to make sure that the, the, the hardware actually flushes things out. We'll cover that later. But the main takeaway here is that the, we almost, except for Postgres, we always want to use direct I.O. because we, do, we don't always bypass the OS page cache because then we're, we're giving up control of what's in actually in memory now. So like in, in most database systems, they'll tell you when you read the manual, assume you're running on a machine that's, that without any other Programs running, you know, no web server, no application server, right? No Bitcoin miner, right? Um, the data system has dedicated hardware. It'll tell you allocate about eighty percent of the memory that's available on the machine to the database system. Except for Postgres, Postgres tells you allocate. I think the rule of thumb is like forty percent, right? Because because you want to maintain some some memory left over for the the OS page cache. All right. So Postgres does this for historical reasons. I don't think there's been any attempt to, to get off of it. I will say though. Uh, when Amazon forked Postgres and made Aurora, which is their sort of flavor of, of or specialized version of, of Postgres, they got rid of they got rid of the page cache reliance, or, or, and they, they managed Aurora manages all the memory itself. So we can actually test and see how uh, see, see you know see that Postgres is actually using the OS page cache um, quite easily. Again, what, why I like using it is because it's like a textbook definition, other than this OS page cache thing, but it's really easy to to play around with and. Um, See what's actually going on. Let me move this. Sorry. All right. Let me log in. So we're going to use the same. Um, okay. We're going to use that same uh, table that we have. I showed it uh, before with the, the the decimals, right? So it'll, it'll be. Um, It 
it'll be a table with, with 10, 10 million entries that are just decimal, de, you know, or real numbers. All right, like that. Huh? Like that. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to restart Postgres, um, and that'll force it to blow away the page cache. I'm sorry, blow, blow away its, its buffer pool. Um, but I'm also going to run this command here to tell the operating system uh, to, to, drop, to drop its own OS page cache. So then we'll also restart. Sorry. All right, so again, we blow away the, the OS page cache. We blow away the, uh, the, um, the we restart the database server. So now nothing is in memory, right? So now I got to reconnect. So turn on timing. And then I'm going to turn off uh, some extra stuff that we don't need. I apologize for that sound. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run, run this query that we, we did before, where it's just taking column A and Adam column B and computing the sum. But I'm going to put explain in front of it, because I want to see what the query plan is. But then inside these parentheses, I'm going to pass in flags to Postgres and say, uh, analyze the qu query plan, meaning show me the query plan, but also run the query and tell me how long it takes the result. Then uh, this buffers flag, which I think I was trying to show before, and I couldn't remember the syntax. This is going to tell us what percentage of the data different were read from, from disk or were available in our, our buffer pool. Right, so now here you see here, uh, there's the sequential scan, and that's just reading the pages one by one. You see here that the uh, from the first setup, it has 4248 uh, pages from disk. And Postgres are eight, are eight kilobyte pages. So I, if I run the same query again, right now you see that it got hit a 32. So 32 pages were, were in the buffer pool. Right? So Postgres is trying to prevent this one query from using all of the pages uh, right away. So it said, OK, well, I'll keep 32 of the pages uh, that you ran last time. I'll keep them in memory. And it'll sort of keep incrementing this or doubling the size and so forth. Right? So now it's going to have 64. So it's slowly keeping pages in memory rather than evicting it right away. So in, uh, in Postgres, there's something called uh, pre-warm. Basically, I can tell the database system, go read this entire table and put it in memory for me. Right? So I run that, and it tells me that it read 44,248 pages. Right? Because remember, before when I showed, when I had a sort of cold start, it had to read 44,248. Right? So that's, that's the number of pages that are, that, are in, that are in this table. So now when I run this again, uh, now you see that the, the has gone up, 16,092, but my read from disk is still kind of high. 28156. So even though I told Postgres, pre-warm everything, put everything in this table in, into my, the buffer pool, uh, it's still not all in there. Right? Let me take a guess what's going on here. Yes? The buffer pool not big enough. Bingo. The buffer pool is not big enough. Exactly right. Yes. So uh, I can figure this out in Postgres because I can call. There's a, there's a parameter called shared buffers. And that tells the data system how much memory you, you, it wants to allocate, right? Because we're not the operating system. We, we just can't take it. Well, we could, but like we, we, you as the user has to tell the database system how much memory is, is it allowed to use. So it's set to one, one, 128. So now when you go look at like this number up here, the, uh, like the hit ratio, like the 16089. So this, this number right here, where it, it, it had 16,000 that it could, could reuse when I ran this query. If we go take that number, um, so it was 1609, 1689, right? So I take the number of pages that were in memory, uh, and, this is, and then I multiply it by 8. So there's 8 kilobytes per page. I multiply by 1025. Uh, I get 125 megabytes. So that roughly matches up with what we what we the, the buffer pool size was, right? So now what we can do in Postgres is uh, let me move this up. 
sorry. We can go and modify our uh, Postgres config file. Right, there's the 128. So what do we need to set this to? Uh, let me go back up in here, look. So we said that it, when we did PG pre-warm, it read what? It read uh, 44248 pages in. So all we need to do now is figure out what, what that is in megabytes. So you can write queries without a from clause, and it's like a calculator. So we need what, 44248 uh, times eight kilobytes. No, it is eight kilobytes, yeah. Eight kilobytes. That gives us the number of pages in in uh, kilobytes, and divide that by ten twenty four. Right? Three forty five. So we need three hundred forty five megabytes to set to put this entire uh, table in memory. So let's round that up. Let's say I don't know three seventy five. Right. So now we got to restart Postgres. Question, what is the eviction policy for Postgres? Yeah. It's LRU. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. All right, so now we restart Postgres. Uh, we'll get disconnected here. Now we get reconnected. Let me make sure I turn off uh, this thing again. Now I'll call PG Prewarm to prefetch that, you know, brought in 44248. And now when I run my query again, Now you see the, the hit number uh, right there. So I told Postgres I want entire query, bring it up. And then now when I run the query, everything's in memory. Things are great, right? So the one thing that, that, that Postgres is also relying on is the OS page cache. Um, this might be hard to see, but let's see how it looks. So I mean, this is not a really good, this is, not scientific, but there's a little blue bar right there. That's the that's the page cache from and that the operating system is maintaining. So if I if I run this query again after even after restarting, it's going to be reasonably fast because the OS is going to be, be still uh, maintaining the cache for me. Uh, but if I blow away the cache, then that'll force it to read everything from disk. We don't have time, but we, we could measure that and see that it actually did read from disk versus like using the OS page cache. Like I said, Postgres is the only one that does that. The reason why I don't think it's a good idea because you just lose. It's it, it makes things some things easier. Uh, like if I restart and come back, uh, I don't have to potentially fetch everything back in from from disk onto memory because the OS page cache could, could could be there. If I my my, my my system bounces and restarts, it gets blown out anyway. So that doesn't help me there. But it does make restarting without restart, restarting the data system without restarting the, the server faster. Um, but like I said like you. If you want to say how much memory that the database system is actually using, you'd have to go look in the page cache in the OS to figure out what pages correspond to Postgres to make that, that actual determination. Yes? Did the query get faster when we gave it more memory? Uh, let's see. Because I, I would think it would because it wouldn't have to read from disk. Uh, yeah, so yes, but, but not much. Um, th this is running on a, I mean, it's, it's not a powerful machine, but it has a fast drive, M2 drive. So reading from disk for 300 megabytes is not that, not that slow. A, a larger, larger table would have, haven't had this problem. Okay. All right. So again, Postgres is the only one that does this. It is what it is. Uh, all right. So now I'll get to his question. Uh, how we actually decide when, what, what frames to, to clear out and remove pages to bring new ones in. So this is going to be called a cache replacement policy in our buffer manager. Uh, if, if basically what happens is when, when a query runs, says, I, I need a page, right? I need a frame to put, bring something in because the thing I need isn't in memory. If all the frames are full, then the data has to decide, okay, which one should I evict? And there's a bunch of different criteria that we, we, we can consider uh, for how we want, want, want to evict things. So, for example, if if I have a page that's dirty and needs to be written to disk before it can be evicted, 
and another page that is that is not dirty uh, that can just be dropped depending on the access patterns and depending on what the query that wants to touch it the next page wants to do you may maybe better to actually write the dirty one out first and flush and, and, and give that one up because it's better off than than dropping the one you're going to need immediately afterwards that that's undirty right so this is again where the Another good example where the enterprise system is going to be way more sophisticated than the open source ones because they're going to maintain all sorts of statistics about how pages are being used and in what context and extrapolate from your query you know, what you actually want to do and what you expect to do next to make the best decision to get the best cache efficiency. Right? And just the, the, the open source systems can't compete in terms of the amount of money and, and time they've had engineers to, to, to work on these things. The, the commercial ones are very, 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 very sophisticated. Yes? Your, your statement is, if I have a query that I run repeatedly, right? Yes. Even, like, let's say that I restart a system and flush all the buffer memory out of it. But the system will still remember, like, statistics about queries of this type, so it will, like, optimize itself. Like yeah, so the statement is, the, even, if there, even if, like, there's statistics I can maintain about the access patterns of pages, or queries on pages, um, and even after I restart the system and blow away my page table, when I come back, are those statistics maintained? I think in the enterprise ones, yes. So, but then it's like, if I want to optimize a query, then I can't really be sure that, that like my query, my new query type will like actually improve the speed so much because running it over and over will like change. Uh, so your statement is, um, if I have a new query and I run it once, but then I run it multiple times, it'll get faster over time. Yeah. Why is that bad? No, but it's like. But then it's like, you know, I, I have an application, I want to make it faster, so I just A-B test a bunch of things, but then, like, the A-B testing is inherently flawed because... Uh, oh, 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 okay. So, so he brings, so he, he's sort of getting to a, a point, well, I'll, I'll rephrase for you. Um, in the database world, oftentimes maximum performance is not the most important thing. Stability is actually more important. So I don't care that if you have a new system where it's going to make 90% of my queries run faster uh, if those 10% of my other queries run slower or, or like sometimes they're fast, sometimes they're slow. Because that makes the system very non-deterministic, makes it very difficult to understand what's actually going on. Um, so to, to your point, like if I start doing A-B testing, like, is this query faster than this other query? Like if the caching policy is, is trying to be clever about certain things, then isn't that going to potentially give me false results to make, have me make, make, make the wrong decision. Um, potentially, yes, but I don't, at the, sort of the low level at the, at the buffer hole manager, I don't think it's that, it's a, it's a huge problem, right? We, we, I'll, I'll think about this. We'll take this offline. Um, all right, so, uh, the, the design decisions you can make when you, when you decide how to build an eviction policy, like you care about correctness, obviously, you want to make sure that you, you evict things that should be evicted or can be evicted. Uh, and likewise, with accuracy, that you're doing this reliably. Speed is super important as well. Like if I, you know, deciding what to evict, is, if it's an MP-complete algorithm, if it takes longer to compute what page to evict versus like just reading from disk, then that's a waste of time. And of course, the storage overhead of all the extra metadata we have to maintain about these, these different access, po uh, access policies. Again, there's an old problem in computer science. Everyone has a paper. I think I have at least two on this kind of stuff. Like, everyone is trying to make something better. Uh, and it, you know, no one has sort of cracked, you know, I think it's unsolvable. But, the, the, you know, the, the enterprise systems do a pretty good job. All right, so the easiest thing you do, uh, or the second easiest thing to do is called least, is least recently used. And all you have to do is just maintain a timestamp of when each page was last accessed. And then when you need to go evict a page, you go see one, find the one that has the oldest timestamp that isn't dirty or isn't pinned, and you go ahead and, and, and you know, swipe that out or flush that out, right? And the way to make this run faster is that you can maintain the, the pages in sort order so that when you want to go look, find the, the, the next page of Vict, you just pop off with, with the front of the, the queue, right? So this is like the most, simp the most simplest thing you can do. Another approach that's common is called clock. Uh, and this is an approximation of LRU. 
So instead of having to maintain that timestamp and that sort order for every single page, instead all you just have is a single bit per page that you set to one when it's, 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 it's accessed. So the way we work like this, say you have, you have you organize your pages in a circular buffer. Everyone has this reference bit set to one, or set, sorry, set to zero at the beginning. And then uh, when a, a query accesses the page, we just flip it to one. And then we have this clock hand uh, that's just gonna sweep around uh, continuously. And anytime it looks at a page, if that bit is set to one, it sets it to zero. If it's set to zero, then it knows that it hasn't been accessed since the last time it swept around. So therefore it could be evicted, right? So I point to this one first, it's set to one, I set to zero. I come here, it is already is set to zero. So I know it's, it's okay for me to evict this, this page because the last thing, you know, I haven't accessed it since the last time I came around. So I can fill a new guy in like that. This, say these other ones get set to one, I sweep around, set it to zero, sorry, sweep, yeah, sorry. Sweep around, set this to zero, sweep around, set that zero, and then I land on this one again, and then it's, it's safe for me to go ahead and evict it, right? So I said, instead of having maintained the, the exact order in, in that the pages were being accessed as I would in LRU, I just say, okay, since some amount of time since I looked at you before, uh, ha have you been accessed? If no, then, then it's, it's safe for me to evict. So clock is used in a bunch of different things outside of database systems. I think Linux uses uh, a multi-hand version of clock as well uh, for, for their page eviction algorithms, right? Th this technique is, 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 this is, this one is very common. So question is it is it expensive to store the time? Expensive to compute or expensive to like to to do what? Sorry. Basically, why 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 do you need your approximation when I feel like storing the time and like special based on time is much easier? I mean, not easier, but like it's not that much. Uh, his, so his statement is like, why do this approximation when s setting the time is so much easier? But what is that time? Is it like system clock time, or is it like a counter time? Like what kind of what, what would be the time? Uh, like the system clock time, I guess. All right, so you got to go down. You got to go down the harbor and get that, right? And then I got to handle like you know, I mean, unless it's UTC, you got to handle like uh, you know, leap years and all that, you know, time zone changes and things like that. Um, usually, in LRU, it often is like a logical counter that you just increment by one. But now that also becomes a bottleneck as well. Uh, and then you also, this also you maintain a bit. So you have a bitmap that you can just flip bits on this and do that very efficiently versus like, now you got to sort of like a 32 bit timestamp for every, you know, every single page, right? But regardless of whether you actually do an LRU or clock, the problem with both of these approaches is that they are susceptible to what is called sequential flooding, right? And that means that when I have a query that does a sequential scan on a table in a bunch of examples that I showed before, we're essentially polluting the buffer pool with pages that may actually not be uh, needed immediately after that query accesses it, right? I said that you could have a little private buffer space uh, like in, in, in some systems to avoid this polluting, but like uh, say you don't have that and you're trying to use this LRU stuff, you could, you could still hit, hit this problem here, right? Because the challenge is that if you're just doing a bunch of sequential scans, LRU is, is exactly the exact opposite of what you want to do. Right? You actually want to use most recently used because I just read this page. If I come back and scan that entire table again, then the page I just read is not the one, on, you know, not the, the most immediate one that I need to read. We, again, we, if we ignore the, the scan sharing, uh, the technique that I talked about. Right? So there are re replacement policies that are specifically designed to handle, to handle this use case. So just to visualize what I'm talking about, so say we have our query like this select star uh, from I A where ID equals one. And say that's again, we have an index, we can go get that you know, single record that we want or single, single page that we need. We go fetch that, in, that into memory. But now our sequential scan query shows up and he's scanning along and he's just flooding our buffer pool with a bunch of bunch of pages. But now at this point here, I got to evict page zero because I need free space. And if I'm doing least recently used, page zero was the last one that was used. So I go evict that, but now the same query shows up again that needs that page zero, and that's the thing I, I just evicted, right? Where in this case here, if I was using, uh, uh, like most recently used, I would probably would want to evict page three or, or page two and one and keep page zero in there, right? 
So one solution to do this is LRUK, which is what you'll be implementing in project one. And the basic idea here is that instead of just having a single timestamp, where it's a logical or, or, a, uh, or a system clock time, it's some kind of timestamp, and I keep track of the last k times this page was accessed. And then now when I would go decide whether to evict a page, instead of just looking at the timestamp that has the, low, the, the smallest one, or the, the, old, the oldest timestamp, I want to go look at the, the, the difference between the last time it was accessed and the most recent time that it was accessed. And I can use that to figure out, okay, which one was brought into memory and then has not been used for a long time. It didn't, was, not used, uh, was not used immediately again. Right? So in that case here, if you, if you just base it on those di that difference, in my sequential scan example from the last slide, uh, page zero would have not been evicted if I kept track of like, oh, it was being used over and over again by queries that are you know, just accessing that one page. Yes? So if k is two, if you store it last two times, you get a difference, right? Yes. But would you ever have more than two? Or like, how would that make sense? Right, so the question is, if you, if you have more than, like, k equals two, it's the last time and most recent time. If you have, uh, would you have more than k? The answer is yes, because you could then use the intervals to figure out, like, uh, like yeah, is there a pattern, yes. So he says, why stop at K? Why, why not maintain a running average for how things are accessed? Again, that's what the enterprise guys do. They maintain all sorts of statistics of like what kind of queries were accessed, what kind of, what kind of queries were accessing it, uh, how often. You can get like, like what users, because some users might have higher priorities than other users. You can do some wild things with, the, with those systems. So the question is, after keeping track of these k things, of these k references, how do you decide which page to evict? Again, if you think L or UK, it's, it's the difference between the last timestamp and, and, and the first timestamp. And then for whichever one has the, the biggest distance, you know it's, it's been the longest gap since I accessed them, so therefore I'm less likely to need this page versus other ones. Yes? What do you mean by last timestamp and first timestamp? Uh, again, so say you, you maintain k equals 2. So I access a page. You know, it's like a stack or whatever, or it's a queue. I access it, I put a timestamp in, access it again, put another timestamp in. If I access it again, I push out the most recent one. Yes? A follow up to the question where k is greater than 2. If you do figure out that there are patterns, then do you start refetching or like what, what action do you take? So his question is if you, with k is greater than 2, uh, what actions do you take? Do you start prefetching? Uh, I don't know whether they maintain. Yeah, I don't know whether they use this for prefetching, um, but assume it's already in memory. You're using the k, the, the timestamps, to decide whether to evict something. But to your point, yeah, you, if you kept the history of, of all the different pages, you'd have to like, you need more context. You, like, you don't want to say, okay, like this random page, I think it's going to be accessed soon without, but there's no query that actually needs it. You don't want to fetch it. So there's more context you need to know. Like the query is doing this, is accessing the table, table this way. And then maybe you could use that to decide, okay, I, I know these pages are going to look like this. I don't know if they actually do that, though. Yes? Uh, what happens if a particular page, or most of the pages, or even all the pages, have not been accessed k times, but you need to evict them? The question is, if you, uh, what happens if, if k equals something and the page does not have uh, k entries, wh what should be the value for those pages? You said it's affinity. Yeah, it, it's, it's not perfect, yes. Right, but it's better than LRU k equals 1. Again, we're not, like, there, isn't, there isn't a magic oracle that's going to be able to say, Here, here's the best caching policy for every possible thing. Right? It's just, does it do OK most of the time? And in practice, LRU k is, is, uh, does better than LRU. There's another one from IBM called ARC. I don't teach that because it's patented, uh, but it has similar protection mechanisms. Yes? This question is, do any systems explicitly use most recently used? Uh, the commercial guys actually might use this for, uh, again, for, 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 for sequential scans, right? For an OLAP system, too, as well. Like, again, it's more complicated because, like, how often are tables being accessed? I don't want to say, oh, it's definitely, it's MRU by, like, it's vanilla MRU without any, any additional accoutrements 
It's never that case, right? But they, there is policies that do something like that. Yes? Could you store like one copy of the actual page and then like a queue of a timestamps for that page? This question is, do you store one actual copy of the page and then a queue of k timestamps for that page? Uh, I mean, you could store it in the page itself. You could store it in, in the page table, right? That's that metadata I said in the beginning, like that reference count, that the pin stuff. You can store it in the page itself. You could store it in, in the page table. If you store it in the page itself, then you get you get durability for free because it'll get written back out. But there's some things that you don't want to actually write back, write out potentially. Like, I don't I don't need to have the pin flag written out to disk because who cares? Because I'm going to reset it every time I bring it back in. Yes. So his, his question is, why is a buffer pool even needed for our OLAP system when you're just doing special commands anyway? Well, we didn't talk about table designs, but like one way to design your database is what's called a snowflake schema, which is why snowflake got its name, where you have this single giant fact table where like think of like Walmart. Every single item I've ever even bought, you just have this giant table. They have billions and billions of purchases. But then you don't store things that are like the name of the item they bought or the size or the price or so forth. You store these in these sort of side dimension tables. So to your point, if you're always just scanning this giant like multi-billion row uh, uh, fact table, you probably don't want to... Buffering always helps, right? Reading from disk is expensive, so you want to buffer that. But maybe you have different policies to pin those dimension tables on the side, right? But if you run out of memory, maybe you want to evict, evict them or not. Or you know, evict one because this one is used more than this other one. You definitely want the data system to maintain cache for this, and everyone does this. All right. Uh, so, in the sake of time, I'm going to I'm going to skip this. We've already sort of covered through this. Priority hints is, is sort of obvious as well, where like the data system can can flag some pages and more important than others. So, a really simple example would be say I have a bunch of insert queries in this table, where I'm just inserting some some primary key value that that's incrementing by one each time. So. I'm always going to be inserting new new data on this side of, side of the tree. Uh, so therefore, maybe I want to have the database system to keep these pages in memory rather than these other ones. Because for the next insert, uh, it's, it's always going to go on that, down that side. And likewise, if I have another query here that says it wants to do a lookup on this index, I actually don't care what the value is. The first thing it's always going to do is access the, the root page of the, the B plus tree or the tree. So therefore, we want to maybe tell the, 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 the database system don't evict that guy because everyone's going to always need it. Right? It's not like a pin. The pin prevents the, the data system from, 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 from evicting it no matter what. Uh, this is just saying, like, hey, be nice if, to not evict this. But if it needs space and, and the page isn't dirty, it's free to do that. I've talked about this uh, a little bit already, about these, these dirty pages. Right? Um, if we're, we're running out of space in, in our buffer pool, we need, we need to take over a frame. If a page is not pinned and it's not dirty, we're free to drop it, and that's super fast to do. There's nothing to do. You just over overwrite whatever the contents were. Um, if a page is dirty, uh, then we, we have to then flush it out the disk to make sure that it's durable after the system restarts. And that'll that'll just that, that, you know. So if I go to, if I go need a page and that there isn't a free page and they're all dirty, I have to wait till that dirty page is flushed before I get my my pointer back to the to the location that I can write into or read data from, right? So again, the, beyond just LRUK stuff, there's, 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 there's a, the system is trying to evaluate, determine, is it better to evict a dirty page and flush it out, or should I just drop a, a free page or an undirty page, even though I, I might need that in the very near future? Right? So the, the algorithms could get quite complicated. To prevent the slow path case where I'm blocked until I write a dirty page out, I can do what's called background writing. And most data systems have this, where there's some thread that wakes up every so often, walks through your buffer pool, just finds dirty pages, and then flushes them out the disk, and then sets the, the dirty the dirty bit to, or unsets the dirty bit, the dirty flag. So again, we've already said this before, we gotta make sure that we don't write dirty pages before the log records are written. I'm rushing this quickly, because um, I, I wanna talk, talk about project one. Um, the memory pool stuff, we, we, we can skip this. Basically, again, there's other memory pools you can maintain, other just for queries. Some, some can be backed by disk, some, some don't have to be. Uh, different systems do different things. All right, so just to summarize, the data system is always going to do a better job uh, of managing memory than the operating system. And I realized, I, I think I, I prefaced this class saying, K 
caching is one of the hardest, oldest problems in computer science, and I'm trying to cram it down into a single lecture. But it is, it, I want to get, get you a sense of the flavor of the different things we have to consider in our database system when we build these, these buffer pools. And then the data system is always going to be in a better position to make better decisions than the system because it knows everything that's going on inside of it. Right? It knows how, how data is moving back and forth, what queries are doing, and there's a bunch of optimizations we can take advantage of. All right, so next class, we'll, we'll kick off on hash tables, but I want to finish up with project one. All right, so any questions about buffer pools before we, we keep going? All right, so project one. We're back on our, on our beloved bus tub system, and this time you're actually working on the system itself, not the, the try thing on the side. So project one will have three parts. Uh, you, the the high-level goal is you're, you're trying to build your own buffer pool manager. Um, and so the first thing you have to build is a extendable hash table. And this is a, a hash table that can, can grow in size as, as, your, as your system needs. Then you have to implement an LRUK replacement policy. And then you have to actually build the buffer pool managed instance itself. Like use the build the page table, run the, the replacement policy algorithm, and move pages in and out. Right? The writing, reading and writing from disk is, is taken care of for you. So uh, we will cover what extendable hash table is on, on Tuesday next week. But you basically have to build a thread, thread, thread safe hash table that's going to be mapping from the, the page IDs to the, to the actual uh, frames themselves. Um, you're going to need to be able to support growing the page table, the growing your hash table. You don't have to support shrinking because that's, 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 it's a bit tricky. And so you can use the, the C++ built-in hash function implementation, implementation. Don't need to roll your own. That's going to be good enough. And then I think this might be out of date. You, you use the rewrite latch that we guys provide you for, to, do, to do protections. So the, the extendable hash table does not need to be backed by disk, right? Because if the system crashes, you, you just build it again. Then for the LRUK policy, there's a separate class to implement this. And then you basically have to run your, uh, you have to maintain, again, the, these, these, these timestamps and when things were accessed. And then we have to do a sweep and go clean things up, um, uh, you know, to, to evict things. And if no page has been touched, you just evict the, the, the lowest one, the lowest page ID. And this should be task three. But now you're going to use your, your LRU replacer to actually implement the, the buffer pool. Um, again, all the disk managers will be written for you, uh, but you, you, know, you have to maintain the actual page table and all the metadata about when pages are pinned, when they're dirty, and so forth yourself. OK? So uh, I don't know about actually number six. I'll double check that. But you don't want to change any files outside the ones we tell you to modify, because those will get overwritten when you load it up in the grade scope. So if you do some, some random custom thing that isn't in the files that you're allowed to touch, you're not going to have that when you run a gray scope. It'll crash. Um, all the projects are cumulative, meaning like if your buffer pool does not work, you're going to have problems <laughs> the rest of the semester. Because uh, now you, when you go implement the B plus tree, if you can't get pages into memory, you can't do anything, right? We won't be providing solutions. Uh, we will have the ability to, uh, where you can keep testing your buffer pool uh, after the project is due. So if late in the semester you think there's a bug or something's coming up, you can always keep trying our tests uh, to make sure everything is working out. Um, and as always, we're not going to teach you C++. At this point, everyone did Project Zero. You should be able to do it. Um, but post on Piazza and come to office hours if you need sort of high-level high questions. So yes? Um, is there any component for efficiency or like? Performance? Yeah. Yeah, one sec, yes. OK, so uh, we don't want you to write crappy code. Uh, I, so we're going to force you to follow the, the, the Google coding style. And then we have the checks in place to make sure that you don't, do, you know, don't have messy code. So his question is about performance. We'll have extra credit if, if you rank high on the leaderboard. So the top 20 implementations in the class will get bonus points. So if, if you're, you have the fastest buffer pool, you basically get 50% credit on this, right? extra credit on this. And then we'll have different uh, levels going down. OK? And then whoever has the, the most bonus points at the end of the semester will get a uh, bus tub t-shirt. If, if you want to buy a bus tub t-shirt, we sell them for $89. Uh, <laughs> but but if, if you get the highest score, you'll get one, OK? Don't plagiarize or I'll you up, OK? <laughs> See ya. Hit it.
strike for the day cold. It's taking its toll. I got a pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a dub. Show some love. Three for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another dead town street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake. 